by yeah. lows of week seven. Here we are. Bye lows or just buy in general. Buy. I think just buy. That is not, not always low because we're going to name some big name people that you're going to have to pay up for, but we're basically saying they're, they're worth buying. Yeah. So the first name I want to throw out okay. uh, is not a buy low. Oh my God. And it's somebody we've mentioned before. Okay. And it's just go out and get Mike Evans. Oh, Mikey Please. Mike Evans. Yeah. Mikey Evans of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Buccaneers. of football has the fifth easiest schedule for wide receiver throughout the rest of the season. They just lost their wide receiver too. Yeah. Uh, v Jax, Vincent mm-hmm. Jackson to a torn ACL. So now Adam Humphreys slides in as the wide receiver too, and he's kind of a possession receiver. So yeah, he'll, he'll see some targets, uh, intermediate pass routes, but it's going to be Mike Evans. It, it's it's gonna been be. Mike Evans up. <laughs> it's going to be me. <laughs> Yeah, he was already I mean, like encroaching on like 15 targets a game. What's going to be like 20 targets a game now? Like it's it's going to be all Evans. Yeah, I mean, he's got he has 59 targets on the year and that is with a bye week. Yeah. Right? He's I mean, if you look at Antonio Brown and AJ Green, the two receivers that have seen more targets than Mike Evans, <laughs> played another they game. haven't had their bye yet. Yeah. Yeah, they played another game and Mike Evans is right with them. Mm-hmm. So he's seen a boatload of targets. Uh his target share is going to go up. Um, they don't have Doug Martin at the moment, yeah. who had a setback. Uh, we haven't even touched on all the injuries that broke today. There's but, a million. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so to, anytime you hear the word setback, especially after the bye, is, is not good. And he's already been ruled out this week. Mm-hmm. And it's, what, they've had one day of practice. So that means there's no chance in their eyes that he will be able to play. Yeah. Which also means he's not even close. Yeah, right. he, because he had the setback last week, apparently. So clearly he, like, aggravated this injury pretty badly, and they just, like, kept it under wraps for a week. And yeah. like, okay, we're practicing. We can't hide this anymore. So, yeah, clearly things with Doug Martin are dark. But it's a good sign for Evans because they can't even go run heavy like they want to. Like, we saw them trying to do that against Carolina when they gave Jaquiz, Jaquiz Rogers 35 touches. So <laughs> they're trying to, like, limit Winston, have Winston do as little as possible. But without Doug Martin, that's just not going to work. So they're going to be forced to throw. Um, it's not going to be good for the Buccaneers' regular football. It's not going to be good for Winston's numbers. But for Evans, it'll be good. Because even if he only gets, you know, if he's getting 20 targets and only, like, half of them are catchable, it doesn't matter. Like, he'll he'll still come up with a big stat line. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think he's kind of game script proof at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't really have the running game to just salt away clock right yeah. now. We don't really know what's going to happen with Doug Martin. But... They're, I mean, Tampa Bay, they're not a great football team. No. They, they've been, they have a very suspect defense, even mm. though they're def- looking at their matchup this week, you might want to stream Tampa Bay, which is completely fine. But if you look at their defense, I mean, their secondary is just, it's been roasted this yeah. entire season. Uh, they're going to fall behind in games. And the last game that they won before their bye was, was a really tight game with Carolina. You thought, oh, that's pretty impressive. And then you look at Carolina and you realize they've <laughs> just had such a bad season. Yeah. And they're, maybe they're just not a good football team. And know? it was with they Derek have... Anderson turning the ball over three times. Like, it took a perfect storm, yeah. Carolina imploding, for the Bucks to barely win that game. Yeah, so I think they're going to be trailing. Maybe not this week against San Francisco, but San Francisco, their defense is bad as well. So yeah. Mike Evans is going to just eat. Uh, he has a very tasty playoff schedule, too, if you mm-hmm. look at Mike Evans, he gives New Orleans twice. Yeah. And they don't have a good de- defense. They no. really don't. And it's not so, going to be better by then either. Like, you see defenses adjust and improve over the course of the season. Like, Saints is Saints are bad enough. They're going to be bad all year. There's no recovering for them. Yeah. And, th- and this is a piece you're going to have to go out and, you know. Pay for. Wow. The yeah. owner. Definitely. Because... You know, if they're savvy enough, they probably realize all these things as well. So you might have to pay equal or maybe slightly slightly more mm-hmm. than you want to pay. Uh, but you can go out and, and trade guys like Demarius Thomas as, as like a starting piece it's to one a of trade. Pieces, yeah. yeah, because, you know, if they're going to give away Mike Evans, they probably want a receiver in return unless they're so stacked at the wide receiver position. Mm-hmm. But I can see you doing like a two-for-one where you trade Demarius and some other small piece to get Mike Evans, and I would do that trade, definitely. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Um, I would do, 
if for some reason you're doing like wide receivers one for one, or maybe just a better way to say this is like, I would rather own Mike Evans and Antonio Brown the rest of the season at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and if like you can, if the Mike Evans owner is like still wowed by Antonio Brown's name and you can like work out a package that isn't just them one for one, because no one, no one really does same position one for one trades. Those are weird. Anyone that's on either yeah. side of that is like, why are we doing this? Some, one of us doesn't know something. Yeah. But like some package that's just like little ancillary pieces with that swap, like I would I would do that as um as a brown owner to get Evans instead. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you blasted out the uh, split brown without Big Ben. That's now it's, it's a relatively small sample size, yeah. but it is, it has been bad. Uh, he dealt with Michael Vick for a period of time. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't pretty. Uh, Landry don't, Jones does not look like a good quarterback. We'll see if he's serviceable while Big Ben is out. But now Big Ben is going to be out for four to six weeks. So it's not just a small, oh, yeah. he'll have to fill in for a week type of situation. It's going to be for the foreseeable future, maybe the next six weeks. Yeah, like that's the official report. But I've also seen people tweeting out like, oh, my inside sources say he'll actually be back week nine. And he's just like playing up the injury so he can look tough when he returns early like i don't <laughs> I've, I've seen like i've seen people i've seen what that being like a legitimate that? thing that's being tweeted out They're, like inside pittsburgh sources are saying that his injury actually so isn't that bad he's only going to be back two weeks but they're playing it up so when he comes back early like the fan base is like inspired by it which if that's true that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever heard <laughs> but, but uh Jeez, yeah that's ridiculous so i don't even know what to say about the whole injury situation in pittsburgh i mean starting with the ladarius green stuff in the off season the preseason and he's supposed to be back isn't he ladarius green <laughs> the last i, I heard mean, uh it was like mike tomlin coming out and someone asked him like oh have you spoken to ladarius green since he like you know came off the ir and then they were like he was like gosh i haven't had time it hasn't been on my list and it's like what yeah. the head coach isn't talking to him that's that's a very he's, bad sign <laughs> Yeah, he's not even in the building right now. <laughs> yeah. But where's Ladarius? No, but yeah, I mean, if that's the case, that's pretty absurd. But, I mean, even if Antonio Brown is Antonio Brown, you can still, I would still consider making that trade oh, if yeah. you get Evans in, like, a piece with Evans. Mm-hmm. Woo, definitely. I mean, because yeah. people even, are going to look. Yeah, even with Ben, like, Antonio Brown hasn't. He's had some elite weeks, but he's also had some duds. Antonio Brown hasn't been, like, the picture of consistency this year that he was, like, drafted as. And Mike well, Evans actually has pick. been, you know, so. Yeah. I would I would make that trade with, like, a running back. I mean, not an elite running back, obviously. No. They wouldn't take that trade. But yeah. uh, maybe, like, an RB2-ish type of back that you can get in that trade with Evans. And I'm making that all day long. All day. Um, right. Yeah. So for us, Evans is basically just like a standing trade target. I think at this point, like any time, yeah. Like though you think you might be able to get him from the owner, or he has like maybe if he has like one quiet week somewhere in this stretch, maybe you try to pounce then. But yeah, he just like at this point for the rest of the season, Evans is worth trying to get. Yeah, and another guy we also mentioned. I'll just bring him up quickly again. Uh, he's on a buy this week, but Jonathan Stewart. Yeah. Uh, again, because he put up twenty points prior to the buy. He's probably not going to come cheap um, unless the owner is just so anti Jonathan Stewart because of his injury history, in which mm-hmm. case I don't know why they would own him anyways, but still. Right. Uh, you know, go out and get Jonathan Stewart. He has a really soft schedule for the rest of the year. Uh, third easiest overall, mm-hmm. the running back position. And what we saw in that New Orleans game was even though Carolina was down huge, he wasn't game scripted out. He had 20 carries. And he had two touchdowns, which is big Ooh. for Jonathan Stewart because yeah. normally he's been like this consistent yardage guy, but he never gets into the end zone because Cam Newton is there. But we kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, even though Cam Newton did have a rushing touchdown, okay, um, I think you're going to see kind of a shift in philosophy with Carolina uh, that they're not going to rely on Cam Newton to be this goal line back to take a beating, uh, you know, they're going to hand the ball off to Jonathan Seward a lot yeah. more. So. Yeah, those two touchdowns were goal line touchdowns. Those weren't like oh. he like took him in from far out, which is usually what happens with Jonathan Stewart. Yeah, they they seem to be saying, okay, maybe we shouldn't just let Cam get beat up every game. Maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe we actually use the running back who's built for that. Yeah. 
So uh, go out and get Evans. Go out and get Stewart. Those are uh, pretty big names that you're going to have to pay up for, not necessarily yeah. buy lows. Um, but yeah, Stewart's on his buy. Maybe you get somebody who is desperate enough to make a trade for somebody who's playing this week. Yeah, you know, if, if you have a team that's in a must-win situation, you you are getting to the the time of the season where there will be teams that are a must-win situations. You know, obviously, if a team's like one and five. Uh, yeah, it's a must win for them. Even two and four is like borderline. Mm-hmm. You can't really take too many more losses because if you lose, you have that fifth loss on your record, and and then it becomes, you know, increasingly more difficult. I mean, I think seven and six is basically the minimum record you need to get into the playoffs. I've seen some teams do it at six and seven, uh, like but I wouldn't want to bank on that. Yeah, yeah, like oh, I'm gonna slide into the sixth spot at six and seven. No, you really need to finish seven and six. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, now it's, de- now it's definitely a good time to try to hit those teams for sure. Uh, for sure. Move on to another buy. Um, I'm gonna throw out the rare, the rare quarterback buy. Um, yeah, here we go. And as a result, it's probably like a a soft buy. Like, don't go out of your way to spend a lot because he is a quarterback. Um, but Philip Rivers um, has the most beautiful playoff schedule you can imagine. Um, his last <laughs> yes, weeks, 13 through 16, are Buccaneers, Panthers, Raiders, Browns. Browns in week 16 during the fantasy championship. Like, that's that's huge. Um, and he's coming off of, like, a quiet week against Denver. And I feel like the perception of Phillip Rivers isn't, like, high-end QB1. It's, like, I don't know that he loses games. Like, I feel like even the Phillip Rivers owner probably doesn't love him to begin with. Um, they probably drafted him as a backup because some people do that. Um, and especially in that situation, if he's someone backup sitting on like the end of their bench, um, now's the perfect time to get him because he probably has a big game against Atlanta this week and then they're like less inclined to do it. So, yeah. 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 I think people look at the situation in San Diego too, and they, they see, Oh, beat up offensive line, Woodhead's out, Keenan Allen's out, Antonio Gates has been banged up. These are Mm -hmm. the names you've come to know with the San Diego offense, especially with fantasy so you're looking at what they're rolling out there and you're like well he's thrown to a tyrell williams he's thrown to a travis benjamin and a milf hunter henry who are these guys you know (laughs) exactly uh yeah (laughs) worst nickname ever for (laughs) a player the milf hunter uh that's disgusting (laughs) it really is i'm sure his parents were hoping for that when they named him hunter i don't know where the name hunter comes from but that i'm sure that's the last thing they were expecting yeah i saw that I saw that on on Reddit, like, <laughs> go out and get MILF Hunter right now. And I <laughs> I have to admit, I like, I giggled a little bit, even though it's ridiculous. I was oh, like, man. what? And everyone That's was like, good. MILF Hunter, please don't let that nickname stick. But yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to be a thing now. It is. It's too uh, late. But, yeah, I mean, he's going to go out and throw the ball. He That's what he does. I mean, we saw him put up huge numbers against Oakland. Um just a week before not that Oakland has a great defense or anything but Mm -hmm. I mean that's kind of his mo so with these pieces that he has in front of him I mean that's basically what he's gonna do he has a really easy playoff schedule and like you said he's a quarterback and he was probably drafted in the later rounds Mm -hmm. Uh, go out and throw some feelers out there you don't want to you know sacrifice the farm for a quarterback you never want to do that but I feel like he can be had pretty cheaply right now yeah, um, so my good examples of, like, I would trade, if they're desperate for a wide receiver, I'd be willing to give up, like, a Michael Thomas for him, you know? Coming off of a few big games, I'd probably do that if I didn't need him. Um, yeah. Or, like, uh, same for, like, Ryan Matthews, you know, if I'm doing well at running back um, and the other person is desperate for running back. Or I might even go as high as, like, Maybe like Jarek McKinnon. But the idea is, is that you're trading someone you don't need. Don't give up like a piece that you're using. This is someone who's like, you have depth at, at a position. You have extra depth and you're like trading off someone you're not using. Because first of all, I mean, he's a quarterback. So even the advantage he gives you isn't that much. And second of all, um, even though his playoff schedule is good, he gets Denver again next week where he's basically going to be unusable and it's in Denver. So he'll be even worse yeah. than he was in San Diego. Um, so you're trading for someone that you kind of, they're like a long-term stash this is really like an end of the bench depth piece and for some spot that they're depleted at yeah here's a scenario for you okay uh would you trade matt ryan for philip rivers plus another piece oh yeah i would do that 
Um, what would the other piece have to be is the question, I guess. I mean, um, you, you'd have to talk to the owner in your league who owns Philip Rivers, but there's a chance that, you know, if people have sh a short memory and they forget to, you know, realize that Matt Ryan did the same exact thing last season mm -hmm. and then fell off the face of the earth. Uh, I mean, he's the highest scoring player in fantasy right now. And if somebody say, you approach somebody and say, hey, I'll trade you Matt Ryan for Philip Rivers, they'll probably be like, uh, what's the catch? Why are you doing this? Right. And then you can be like, oh, well, you're right. Matt Ryan's been so good. He's an elite quarterback. One, Philip Rivers is like fringe. So why don't you toss in like another piece? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, obviously you won't get an elite piece, but maybe some of the guys you just mentioned. Yeah, I would do it you for know, one like of those Jer guys. Jarek McKinnon. McKinnon, or yeah. Or something like that. Or like, um, like a wide receiver. Like, I'm kind of curious to buy Macklin. I don't know if he's a firm buy low, but I'd probably do it for, like, Rivers and Macklin. Um, or, like, Jeremy Hill, who is at least, like, slated to kind of be better than he has been the last couple of weeks now that the matchup is there. Yeah. Um, or, like, someone that's, like, a slightly bigger name but has, like, struggled for a few weeks. Like, maybe, like, Jordan Matthews. You might be able to do that, and I would definitely would if you could. Oh yeah, there's there's a lot of players out there that I'm struggling that mm -hmm. you can probably knock on the owner's door and just say, hey, you want you want to get rid of them? You're probably frustrated. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, we've seen a lot of people drop these guys that were drafted high. This is around the time of the season where you're going to see it. Yeah. Like last week, it was Golden Tate. Everyone dropped, and then they probably were fuming at the fact that he finally had a good game because he was drafted way ahead of our. His ADP was way ahead of Marvin Jones at the beginning of the offseason. And then yeah. it kind of regressed a little bit. But, I mean, I've seen Doug Martin get dropped in certain yeah. areas. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're probably players that are sitting on opposing teams' benches or even in their lineup where the only reason they're holding on to them, even though they've struggled, is because they drafted them so high. And if that's the case, then you come in with anything and they're like, okay, I, I just didn't want to drop them. You know, I just want to get rid of them. Yeah. So. For who's sure. next, next up. Uh, this is probably an unpopular one. I haven't seen anyone mentioning his name anywhere on the internet as a buy. So this is a bench stash branded by and that's right, La Latavius Murray. Oh, um, there he is. Tay train. Yeah. Coming off of missing two weeks and being kind of underwhelming for another two weeks before that. Um, most people are just treating him like he's borderline droppable. Um, but tell yeah. our adoring fans why he is a, a buy, a purchase. A buy. Well, the narrative with the Tavius Murray was before the season even started, before people knew who Jalen Richard was, mm -hmm. was that he was already like on the hot seat in Oakland. This was before the preseason even. It was that was a narrative that Latavius Murray is going to be usurped by deandre washington and that is why deandre washington was one of like the most popular handcuff options out there and was probably drafted in almost all leagues mm -hmm. in all formats and maybe the 10th round 11th round he was one of the more popular handcuff options uh season started and latavius murray was losing touches right away right he had a good game in new orleans he had uh, a good game against Atlanta, but then his Tennessee game was kind of saved by a touchdown. And then the following week, I mean, his usage in Baltimore just it was non-existent, basically. It was a full blown-out committee. So people were looking at that and saying, like, oh, man, now he's hurt with this toe injury. He's borderline droppable. But here's the thing. If you've watched the last two Oakland games, you've realized that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. With Latavius Murray, even within the Oakland fan base, people were saying, oh, he's god-awful. You know, he's just this big body, this athletic freak, uh, but can't do anything with his frame, doesn't hit people. Mm -hmm. uh, DeAndre Washington's a better guy. Well, if the last two games, both Washington and Richard have been highly underwhelming. Um, they haven't re really been able to block. Derek Carr has been under the most pressure he's, he's been under all season long. And they just, they're not getting it done on the ground, really. And Kansas City, 
with the field the way it was, that should have been a game where they exploited Kansas City's defense a little bit. Mm-hmm. Who, I mean, up until that point in the season, hadn't been good. Yeah. And they hadn't really been good at all. And they couldn't do that. And now the articles that are starting to come out from the Oakland beat writers, they're saying, like, okay, the Raiders are really missing Latavius Murray. Like, mm-hmm. this is apparent. And the coaches are saying it. And even Derek Carr came out. That was the first thing he said after the Kansas City loss was, uh, we miss Latavius Murray. We need Latavius Murray in there because that would have been the type of game where you would have seen Latavius Murray get the bulk of the work Mm -hmm. to try to wear down Kansas City. And they tried to do that with DeAndre Washington. He was the one who got the bulk of the work against Kansas City, and he just couldn't do anything with it. Um, So Latavius Murray, uh, surprisingly, one knock on Latavius Murray was always he couldn't hit anybody. Okay, he would go down at first contact. He is amongst the league leaders in yards uh, after contact right now. I mean, he's 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 I right with David Johnson. Mm-hmm. Okay, they have the same yards after contact. He has a better yards after contact than Ezekiel Elliott, than LaShawn McCoy, than Demarco Murray. Wow, and Carlos Hyde. Uh, well. You the know. Carlos Hyde? The Carlos Hyde. <laughs> so when he's playing, uh, he is bowling people over. And yeah. I know pe- the concern was his usage, but you're going to see Latavius Murray come back to, I'm not going to say he's going to be a workhorse, but he'll get running back one usage when he gets back on the field. I mm-hmm. think that much is apparent. Yeah. DeAndre Washington and Jalen Richard will still spell him every once in a while, but it's not going to be that split you saw in Baltimore. And if you realize... The Baltimore game where he had his lowest usage of the year was the game he got hurt. So mm. he obviously wasn't full speed. Um, that was also the game that Lee Smith, our blocking tight end, went out. Oh, I said R. Oops. <laughs> I made I made that, that <laughs> terrible mistake. Your entire for- analysis is ruined because it's been revealed you're an Oakland fan. <laughs> I know. Oh, my <laughs> God. What have I done? Oh, man. Oh, Not that they didn't already bias, know. I mean, anytime the Raiders get brought up, you I'm, you go on like a diatribe. I'm surprised when we were talking about where and Charles, you didn't somehow turn that into why the Raiders lost and just make it all about the Raiders. I was ready for that, and you found a way hey, to not uh, do it. I mean, the, the Raiders lost because they just got dominated. <laughs> they basically. just got beat. That's they lost because they got beat. It, it, was, <laughs> it, it was a terrible game to watch, and especially because it started out so well, too. They drove down the field, scored the touchdown. Their defense had a three and out against Kansas City, and then Oakland got the ball back. I was like, this is it. We're for real. And We're then just it was gonna, over. You know, pound <laughs> Kansas City into submission here, and then Carr threw an interception, and Kansas City came right back and tied the game. And I was like, oh, my God, what is happening? <laughs> what is this? Why? What is this? Why? Um, Anyways, let's move on from Latavius. We anyway. go out and buy Latavius Murray. His value is probably so low right now. Uh, he, he came back to practice today, by the way. So yeah, he's back. There's a chance. Yeah, there's a chance he'll play. Probably a fairly high chance that he plays this week against mm-hmm. Jacksonville. Uh, so, yeah, go out and get him. Get him. Yeah, he should be pretty cheap because whoever the owner is, they're on that person's bench. They're frustrated. Um, and they're probably they're probably wishing they could drop him at this point. So like, oh, he was he wasn't good when he was healthy, and now he's hurt. What what am I dealing with this guy? So he should be he should be dirt cheap. Um, yep. And I Who's agree with next? all your analysis, despite the fact that it's all been revealed all as biased. biased. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Our last, I don't know about our last, but our buy, our next buy is uh, one Todd Gurley. Um, what? Yeah. I'm going to be honest. Earlier in the season, I didn't think we'd ever be recommending him as a buy. Like, he was like a hold. It was like, well, you have him. Hope it gets better, you know. And he's not really a sell because, like, the production wasn't there. Um, but now, like, seeing the way this offense has trended the last few weeks, um, yeah. I'm inclined to buy in on him, uh, especially in that Detroit game. If you if you didn't watch it and you're just looking at the stat line, like, oh, he only had single-digit points again, you know, boo-hoo, you know, more of him being disappointing. But if you watched it, you saw that in that first half, he had a lot of running room, and he was, like, taking advantage of it. He was, he was ripping off big runs left and right. Um, the one thing that sort of hindered him was volume, weirdly enough. Usually he's sitting there, you know, 25 to 30 touches. Uh, and he only got 18 in this game. Because for whatever reason, the the Rams are like, let's air it out. And 
It, it's just yeah, like and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> it worked perfectly. Yeah. It was this weird game flow of like all the red zone work went to Kenny Britt and Case Keenum taking it in the end zone himself. Yeah. Like not really things we've seen at all this season. Uh, but like the encouraging things were like the running room was there. You know, the offensive line was finally showing some push. Uh, looked better and. For me, one of the big things I was worried about was that with Benny Cunningham coming back, he might lose that passing down work he had had for a couple weeks. Uh, but he didn't. He got, you know, he got four targets. He caught all of them for 39 yards. Um, so I think they've kind of bought in on him as like this, you know, situational third down back, which is a huge boost to his value because the whole thing with him is, you know, give him some space and he can do a lot with it. And we've seen that in the passing game. So that's like he suddenly has this nice cushion too, where even if his like, yards per carry is a little bit disappointing if he keeps getting volume and he's getting passing down work that kind of like boosts that up and then you're just you know hoping the yeah the touchdowns to come again he only has one touchdown on the season so oh, i mean three touchdowns on the season but still more touchdowns are coming yeah oh yeah yeah and if you watch the game against detroit also you saw him get stuffed on one goal line attempt which was disappointing for girly owners right but you mentioned case keenum taking a touchdown in himself that's not going to happen mm. a lot of the time it was a quarterback keeper uh, where they just played off of the fact that Detroit was selling out Sub Gurley at the goal line. And yeah. Keenum basically walked in, did cartwheels into the end zone. Nobody was even near him. Uh, but yeah, Gurley, he looked good. I mean, his first carry of the game, he ripped off a 15-yarder, and he yeah. looked vintage. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing with Gurley was that he was his yards after contact were more than his yards per carry, which is absurd. Yeah, he leads the league in yards after contact, doesn't he? Uh, he was up there for... Let me see what his yards after contact I thought I saw someone tweet that out, but I didn't look it up myself, so they could have been wrong. It's come down a little bit. Okay. He, right now, he sits at, where is this? Todd, one Todd Gurley, oh my. So yeah, so I have to scroll too far down the list to even find him. (laughs) All right, well then, I I read something else. I'm confused. Um, Yeah, the... Uh, No, no, he still has a, he has a high enough yards after contact Mm -hmm. it's just it's come down from where it was it was tops in the league at one point right yeah the and another sort of encouraging thing with him is um like teams have been sort of being like we're going to take away Gurley and dare you to beat us through the air um and that's kind of been blowing up in their face like Case Keenum has taken advantage of that um they should have. The Rams should have won this game. Like it's it's, it's their own fault. They lost it, um, yep. and they were being able to air it out, and it was working. And you know, teams are going to see, you know, through what we've seen through the season so far, that they need to start respecting the pass when it's there. You know, they can't be like, we're going to take away Gurley and dare you to beat us through the air because that's they're beating them through the air when they let them do that. So I think we're going to see, you know, the boxes start to soften up a little bit. The line is looking better. Um, and his matchups aren't, you know, his schedule softens up now a little bit. Um, he gets Carolina after the bye. Well, he gets he gets Giants, not really that scary anymore. They're scary to start the year, but they've kind of, after we saw yeah. Terrence West run all over them, I'm not as scared of them. Um, then the bye, then Carolina, not scary. Um, Jets, you don't love, even though we just saw David Johnson kind of murder them. Yeah. Um, I mean, that mostly came on one uh, run, but it was like probably the most impressive run of the week. So that's cool. David Johnson, man. And then Miami, which doesn't scare me as much anymore. And then he gets New Orleans, like the dream matchup. And then New England's not great. And then Atlanta, another dream matchup. And then week 16, he gets San Francisco. So like he, yeah. he gets these great matchups sort of on and off through the rest of the season. Yeah, as the offense has improved we saw him play san francisco in week one and just this that's what started this whole mess with todd Gurley, right yeah uh but by week 16 when he gets san francisco at home um i mean that's a dream matchup for a running back in the Mm -hmm. championship week Uh, his his yards after contact is actually lower than i anticipated it's gone down (laughs) to 2.3 uh which is you know it's not great to be honest it's right around where matt forte is Ooh, the elite Um, matt forte the elite matt forte um but the narrative with todd Gurley was that he was just he had no space whatsoever he was getting blown up in the backfield a lot Mm -hmm. and he was getting touched immediately he basically had no running room and that was apparent with his early season yards after contact being equal with his yards per carry because he was getting hit so quickly after getting the ball that he basically had to fight just to gain two yards um 
But like you said, a schedule softens up. Watching the Detroit game, the offense as a whole looked better. Now, Detroit has a bad defense. Let's not skirt around that issue. Mm -hmm. But even before that, they had shown signs of life a little bit, like Case Keenum not being as bad as he was in the opening game against San Francisco. He's been pretty serviceable since then. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely been serviceable. And, you know, if that happens, if they get Kenny Britt going like they did against Detroit, I mean, that was ridiculous, Kenny Britt. He was a top wide receiver last week, mm-hmm. which I'm sure you weren't surprised about that. That's exactly what oh, you thought man. was going to happen. That's like Kenny Briggs for my best call of the year, and it's not even based off of analysis. It's just based off of like, you know what, man? Kenny Britt because uh, hard knocks, and it's got to be someone. Why not Kenny Britt? And like it's, I know it's worked out. If you if you listen to that, even though I didn't listen to that myself, if you listen to that, uh, then good for you because Kenny Britt is now the wide receiver one. I don't know if that's true, but I'd like to think it is. Sure. Yeah, let's just go out and call him the wide receiver one. And you see him, he, his shirt's too small. It looks like he went, you know, to the uh, his jersey. It's working. Looks like he went to the, the kid's section of Target or something and picked up a Rams jersey. You can <laughs> see, like, his entire abdomen when it's at certain points, and he's just showing off his, like, ridiculously defined six-pack. He's got the whole, like, Ezekiel Elliott thing going on. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, he looked like a beast in that game. And if they start threatening teams with the pass and Gurley's just gonna gash yeah he really is Gurley's so. gonna crush gash and so now is the time to get him <laughs> there it is um all right Woo. let's let's move on i think we have one last buy um alan robinson okay yeah this one there. this one we're kind of unsure on because of how bad how just like horrific this jacksonville offenses looked um it's not been good no but his schedule is about to get really good like he just played chicago and chicago actually has a sneaky good uh Mm -hmm. defense they're they're getting treated like this is an exploitable defense we haven't really seen that actually in the numbers and now he gets oakland then tennessee chiefs you know texans lions bills like none of those are scary that's a pretty like nice stretch of good matchups yeah i mean that's what you have going for you if you go out and get Allen Robinson. So mm-hmm. um, I think he's in a spot where he's definitely acquirable because the owner has seen a few good weeks, but the majority of his weeks have been subpar, right? And they just came back. And if you actually go back and look at the game against Indianapolis, he didn't really have great numbers other than the touchdown. He only had 55 yards. Yeah. And actually, if you look at his receiving yard total, he's only broken 60 yards once this mm-hmm. entire season. And that was in the opening week against Green Bay, where he caught six passes for 72 yards. Um, if you look at his line after that, three catches against San Diego for 54 yards, seven catches against Baltimore for 57, five catches against Indianapolis for 55, and then three catches against chicago for 49 Mm -hmm. so those are really abysmal like basically replaceable wide receiver numbers you can go out and get those wide receiver numbers from anybody yeah you know 50 yards that's cole beasley right there (laughs) oh no cole Cole beasley's elite actually all (laughs) the the elite cole beasley he's finally developed these are eddie royal receiving numbers they really are yeah five for 55 the only thing that saved him in the weeks against baltimore and indianapolis were the touchdowns Mm mm-hmm so he is yet to go off. And if you think about that, when you're looking at a player, um, and I guess this is the buy segment, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of just <laughs> shit talking all over. No, no. Like It's it's good to bring this stuff up, though, because this is how you drive his price down. Like The owner can't yeah. be like, well, it's Allen Robinson. It's like, well, forget his name. Look at his production. It hasn't been there. He's been touchdown dependent. And it should be pretty easy to drive him down as like a, a wide receiver, too, that you're buying. you know. And then at that point... You know, regardless of the poor yardage, the touchdown upside is high with him because he's like the de facto red zone target there. And the schedule is is now soft enough um, that he should see more of those is kind of the hope. Um, And if he doesn't, then this is bad advice and don't buy Allen Robinson. But (laughs) (laughs) at least for one week against at least the next two weeks, like Oakland and Tennessee, like those feel like games where the. The Jack should be able to score in those games. And you got to hope Allen Robinson is part of it. And maybe you're selling him in a couple weeks after those games. I don't know. Um, this might be like um, a catch and release with Allen Robinson because his name 
is for some reason still worth so much. Even though he only did it for one season, people still hear Allen Robinson. That's a wide receiver one. Absolutely. And so if 100%. You can, 100%. So if yeah. you can drive down his price to wide receiver two, you know, have him put up a couple good games and soft matchups and then flip him as a wide receiver yeah. one, then, hey, that's good. I think I just convinced myself that he is a sell for me instead of a buy. <laughs> like as That's I fine. was going through those numbers, I was like, wait a minute. This looks bad. Be- because of what you just said, because he still has the name Allen Robinson, I would go out and sell him. Let's just transition right into ourselves. <laughs> 